entire uh, video history uh, in the National World War II Museum will be exported out to uh, schools and classrooms all across the country with our electronic capabilities that we're building. So uh, in any event, uh, uh, it, it's important and, and uh, we're, we're pleased that you're making some time to do it. They have said that we only have 30 minutes and uh, want to honor that time, but we wanted to talk about, of course, uh, just to explain, starting with uh, Pearl Harbor uh, and your experiences enlistment, uh, then looking at your training in Camp Shelby and, and your maybe a little bit of your New Orleans mm -hmm. experience, uh, and then uh, looking at your combat experiences in Italy and France and then back to Italy and your Medal of Honor action. And then finally, something that maybe has not always been part of your oral histories that you've done uh, for others as, as well as for Steve Ambrose in the past, but like to, at the end, if we have time or maybe at another time, uh, like to have you talk a little bit about uh, uh, how World War II uh, shaped your life as an individual, uh, your career, and, and also from your position in Congress, uh, looking back now some 70 years, uh, what did it mean for our country? What was the legacy of World War II for our country and for the world? And that's sort of a, another section of the museum that will be on the story of liberation and post-war uh, uh, America and post, uh, so all the, the, the great rivers that come out of that uh, war and, and how it impacted our society. <clears throat> so, um, so we can approach this uh, and try to get all four of those big topics in in 30 minutes, or we can just take our time and schedule another time, or what is your... You got more than 30 minutes. Okay. Well, let's just uh, start at the beginning mm -hmm. then, and uh, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, where you were in, uh, when Pearl Harbor uh, strike occurred, and uh, what did you do on that day? December 7th, 1941 was a Sunday. So as we always did on Sunday, we got ready for church. And just about the time of the attack, I happened to be listening to the local radio, putting on my necktie, and all of a sudden this commentator started getting berserk. And he's saying, Pearl Harbor is being attacked. The Japs are bombing us. And I thought this was just one of these uh, crazy shows, like Orson Welles. And uh, I didn't take it too seriously until he just kept on doing this. So I called my father and I said, let's get out on the street. And look towards Pearl Harbor and poof, all that smoke. And you could see puffs of the anti-aircraft shells exploding. And then all of a sudden, three aircraft flew right over us, gray in color with the red dot on the wing. I knew my life had changed. Wow. And then what did you do after <clears throat> that? You were a medic, uh, well, I had medical training? Well, I took off my necktie, didn't go to church. I reported immediately to the first aid station. And there, just by coincidence, it was destroyed because the unexploded ordnance came down and hit that place. And the civilian casualties, the first ones, were in our area. Wow. So, so I, I saw a lot of blood that saw day. Saw a lot of blood that day. Uh, you were still in high school or just finishing? I was 17 years old a senior in high school. And uh, pre-med? Pre-med, yes. But then in 42, uh, uh, you, uh, well, for, first of all, how did you feel about us going to war with Japan as well, a Japanese-American? When December 7th happened, about a month later, about Christmas, New Year's time, the government of the United States announced that uh, Japanese citizens and otherwise were to be designated 4C. 1A is physically fit, 4F is no, 4C is enemy alien. So here I was, 17 years old, who considered himself 
lover of this country and patriot, call an alien enemy. And so I joined a group of men and we petitioned the President of the United States. And about 10 months later, a response came in, opening the doors for us to form an organization, Combat Team. And I'm proud to say that when they opened the doors, 80% of the eligible Japanese Americans volunteered. And uh, you were in Nisei uh, at that time, 442nd? Yes, sir. 80% uh, uh, were. And uh, you enlisted in, uh, uh, reported for duty in San Francisco? No, we reported for duty in Hawaii. Hawaii. And we were shipped from Hawaii to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And there we got on a train. We had no idea where we headed for. And so the word came down, we're going to Mississippi. And I said, oh my Lord. Because the only thing we knew about Mississippi was that that's where they lynch people, you know? <laughs> and our shades were down all the time. When we're in some railroad station, it would be raised when we're out in the open in the national park or something like that. But when we got to Mississippi, we were greeted by at least a hundred gray dress uniform women with the Red Cross. And they served us coffee and donuts. And I said, this is really aloha. And uh, within weeks, homes and farms were opened up to us to spend a couple of hours having hot dogs with them. So the people of Mississippi are very good to us. I have fond memories of that area. And then uh, you had some USO experiences there and uh, other social activities? Well. That's the first U.S. war dance I went to. And the young girls were all from Mississippi, Hattiesburg, and they're all white. I've never danced with a white girl. It was nice. <laughs> and then you went off to New Orleans, I remember you telling me one time to the, to the Roosevelt, spent the weekend several times. I, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't tell you, but I'll tell you, I ran the biggest crap game <laughs> in, the, in the regiment. And, but I didn't want to make money, so I rented a suite at the Roosevelt so the losers can go there. That's my guest. And so once, I, I've been to New Orleans during that time, maybe about four or five times. Ate at the fancy French restaurant. Antoine. That's the one. <laughs> I didn't understand what escargot was all about, but when I saw that, I said, people eat that snail. <laughs> and you were well treated uh, every time you went. Oh, absolutely. As a Japanese American, uh, did that begin to uh, change your thinking about your country or about yourself in terms of uh, your experiences at Camp Shelby and in New Orleans? Well, I realized that there were problems in every state. We had uh, segregation in the South, and um, but I was confident that in this war we all served together. For example, uh, in my last battle, we were attached to the 92nd Division. 92nd Division is an all African American division, 92nd. And so the hospital was run by them. I had 17 transfusions. Each time they gave you a transfusion, they showed you the bottle with the label on, donated by so-and-so, 92nd Division. So as far as African-American blood, I, I believe I have 17 pints of it. And still I'm here. Still here. That's great. 
Well, let's move across the Atlantic to, uh, to Italy when you first arrived. Uh, where did you land? Where did you go in? We landed in Naples, mm -hmm. and it was an eye-opener because I saw Pearl Harbor, yes, but I've never seen a city demolished, buildings down and rubble all over the place and people begging and young girls selling themselves. It was a, a terrible awakening. It was obvious that war was terrible, but my first introduction to that was uh, unforgettable. And from there, you headed north, or where was your first combat? Uh, before Rome or after that? It was just about Rome time. Mm -hmm. And uh, got my first state of state taste of war. It wasn't good, but that's where I learned to become a good sergeant. You're a platoon sergeant? I started off as an assistant squad leader, and because casualties were pretty high, before I knew it, I was platoon sergeant. How did you move up? What uh, brought them to your, brought you to their attention? That, uh... Well, I was considered in my company a pretty good patrol leader. And so when the battalion asked for a special patrol, because we had to do a daylight um, replacement of the third battalion by our battalion, a full battalion moving in, broad daylight. So it had to be in a place where everything was hidden. So they sent me out. So they asked me to make a route and come back as soon as you can. While going on this route, I came across stacks of bodies, all men. So I got off the trail and went underneath, came up. And so when I told the colonel, we're ready to go, sir. So he says, lead the way. And then he saw me going down. He gave the order, stop. He came running up to me and says, what the hell are you doing? I says, Colonel, if you'll come with me. I took him around the bend and I showed him the bodies. I said, you want your men to see this? Wow. He said, continue. <laughs> After uh, that, I, I got involved in all kinds <coughs> of patrols. You're a pretty good shot, too, I understand. With the rifle, with the M1? You know, I, I never fired a gun before I got in the service. Not even a BB, believe it or not. My mother was such a devout, devout Christian, a Methodist, that she didn't want anything like that in the household. And uh, she gave me a good scolding when she saw that I had made a slingshot. You know, what are you going to do with this? Or oh, kill birds? You don't kill anything. So here I am, no experience. I go to the firing range. I'm number one in the company. And the company commander says, it's obvious you have no bad habits. And so they made me uh, the first important position I had, I was a sniper. Which is terrific in a company, because you have a scope. You know, I, my first gun was an O3 as a result, with a scope on. Wow. Uh, had you heard yet of the exploits of the 100th Battalion yet? Uh, we knew there. that the 100th Battalion was ahead of us, mm -hmm. and they were doing heroically and did very well. Mm -hmm. And the casualty listings were very high. And all of us had relatives in the 100th. Yeah. So it was a close relationship. My uncle was in it, for example. 
So how much further north? Uh, well, first of all, you went into Rome too, right? Uh, after General Clark. No, we did not go you in. Didn't go in. We were right up to the gate. We were stopped because we looked so dirty. You know, after you've been in combat for a couple of weeks with no time to shave and shower, you know, you're not going to look Hollywood. So we just sat on the sideline, and a new bunch came in with neckties, cleanly shaven. <laughs> uh, they're, they're not the conquerors. They came in for the cameras, huh? With the but general if, part. So if you look at the first troops coming into Rome, they all have neckties on. And we don't go into combat with ties on. No. We're not that formal, you know. All you guys look like Willie and Joe from Carl Malden. The That's cartoons. the guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so did you go much further north uh, of, of Rome before being shipped over to France? Yes, we crossed the Arno. Mm -hmm. We went up close to Florence. Then they called for us to go to France. So, so you went to France in the summer, late summer of 44? And there we, our first major battle was to rescue the Texans. The 36? Yep, a battalion of them. Well, why don't you, uh, and, and you were really regarded as assault troops. Yes. Really, I mean, uh, at that time. And uh, so you went up, tell us about uh, how you did that, how you went and res did that rescue. Well, when this happened, the Texans sent two regiments, one, and the first regiment got pulled back. The second one went up, same thing. So they called us. We were fighting on the left flank. And so we reported. And many of us said to ourselves, this is the moment we've been waiting for. Really? Because we've been involved in a lot of battles, but they're like other battles, small. But here was a big one. Here you're going up against a whole division, too. A whole division of Germans. With a regiment. And they had surrounded this battalion. And so we went. So this was big time. And you knew it at the time. Oh, absolutely. And we rescued them. It cost us a lot. We had over 800 casualties. Of that number, over 200 were dead. <clears throat> the Texans had about 64 casualties, but it was worth it. Well, you guys must have had a little swagger after that, though, huh? It was a, a respect no, or no, respect it wasn't. from. It, it from was not swagger, but they they showed us a little respect. For example, after the battle, we'd go into one of these. French saloons, and the Texans be sitting around, they all stand up. Uh, we get a first round of drinks free. <laughs> we all made honorary Texans. <laughs> you still have any certificate from Texas? That <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> but the thing that really struck me was, after the battle at the direction of the division commander, he wanted to personally thank us. So he says, I want you to assemble. So we had a retreat parade, a very formal one. All lined up, as they have report, E-Company, all present, counter for and all of that. And the general turned to the colonel. I wasn't there, but I was told by one of those, uh, Colonel, I said I wanted the whole regiment out here. Well, I can understand why he said that, because one company had only eight men, and the company commander was a staff sergeant. That's how high the casualties were. And the company that I served in had the largest number, 42. So you can imagine going down the parade route with a company with eight men, I was with 42. And the band was cut in half. Because in combat, our band put down their instruments, and they all became stretcher bearers. 
So they have to go out to the front to pick up bodies and bring them back. So their casualties were pretty high too. So you can imagine going down, the band playing with one trombone and two saxophones and I think one trumpet. And <laughs> but it sounded glorious, believe me. I'm sure it did. You know, there must have been several emotions that you felt. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you had uh, the, cr the, the battle creds of, of having, uh, you know, achieved uh, something other regiments had tried and, and didn't succeed in. But there must have also been uh, a feeling that your own patriotism and your loyalty couldn't be questioned anymore uh, as a Japanese American after that battle. Is it, which, it, was either of those stronger in your own feeling at the time? Well, it was obvious. It was a test for us. If we had failed, people might have said, well, they're no good. So I think all of us sensed that. We may not have said so in so many words, but it was obvious that this was a big assignment. The other regiments had failed, and here we are being called in. And we're not Texans. That's terrific. And you received a battlefield commission uh, for this battle? Yes. That's pretty impressive, Senator. I, I was know. too young. Yeah. I'm 20 years old, that's too young. Well, how did that happen? I mean, I mean, I know, I mean, just tell me about the process of receiving the commission. Well, we're all set to go into another attack. And here I am with just the ammo and grenades and gun. A messenger comes crawling up to me and he says, uh, the captain wants to see you. I went back and the captain handed me an envelope. Go to the adjutant, he wants to see you. I had no idea I've got this envelope here. Inside was a commission but I thought it was a court-martial. And try, I'm trying to figure out what did I do wrong? So I get there and somebody salutes me, one of the sergeants. And I, it then occurred to me what was happening until I got in and I said, sir, I'm here, what's up? He says, you haven't seen the envelope? I said, no. Open it, read it. It was my commission. So they gave me a physical, I was underweight, but he says, what's your normal weight? I gave it normal weight, he said, okay. And when I got back, I'll be honest with you, the battle was over. This was the last push, but uh, my platoon, when I left them, had 14 men, and I came back to had 10. Well, in terms of not having had any training uh, as an officer, uh, did you get any advice from uh, uh, when, when they gave you the commission about how to be a, a leader, an officer? Or? Well, my company commander said, it's not going to be easy for you because from now the men will serve you. But you s sit there like a superior. You know, that's not easy. I'm the youngest guy in the regiment. <laughs> but you learn a few things on your own. For example, after every battle, which is something done all over the United States Army, the fellows take a break. They go out to the village or to the city and have fun. I tell my men, you go out and have fun but you'll be back two days before we go into action. Not on the evening before the action. So when they come back, I, we go through training again. So when combat comes back, we're ready. My casualty rates in the company was the lowest in the whole regiment. Really? It's hard to believe this, but during the time I was platoon leader, only one man died. Wow. 
That's impressive. Then I did something else. I don't know whether I should discuss this, but uh, I told you I was always called upon to go on patrols. In every unit, there are men who are tough and who are some who are cautious and some who are not quite ready. And if you were the type that would pick only the tough guys to go on patrol, then what happens to the others? You know, they'd be looked upon and say, what, what the hell's wrong with you? So I had an arrangement with the colonel and with the captain that about 10% of my patrols were phony. But if I would sit down with the squad and or the platoon and say, we're going to do this and this is the destination, and, you know, put all that, the juice begins flowing, you know. And it pays off because when you come back, you've thrown grenades and everything else, you don't see anyone there. But I tell them, watch out, let's get out of here. And when they get back, they're talking among themselves. Wow, that was terrific. There were 10 guys out there. <laughs> but they felt part of the team, everyone. Well, you learned uh, a lot about leadership uh, and evaluating different people and what you need to make them part of the team. The reason was simple. I wanted to get home. <laughs> <laughs> it was survival leadership. Uh, had to survive, but you knew you had to have a, a team of confident people and everybody had to learn how to do it. That's impressive. That's really impressive. Uh, well, hey, Ben, uh, let's get back to Italy then. You got moved after your commission. Uh, you moved back into northwestern Italy, uh, hooked um, up with the 92nd. That's right. And, Old African American yep. division, and uh, you were—they were engaged, and you were too. Then, with your 442nd in the well, offensive, or what? we came to the the German line there, which had been not moving at all for about six months. We were gone from Italy for about six months, and they wanted us to break that line because. We were close to the end of the war. That was the most difficult decision to follow. Two weeks before my injury, all the officers were called in. We were sworn to secrecy. And uh, what, what do we do? Put up our hands, you know? Who addressed you? Who, who called you? Company in? commander. Company commander. Each company had done this. And our company commander was from Texas. He looked at us, he says, the war's over. They're negotiating now. But you don't tell your men. We'll keep on pushing, otherwise they might delay this. It's not easy, knowing that it's over. You know, you want to dig the hole deeper. But right. But if you did that, the war would last longer. And your, you had an objective there. Was it Mount uh, Valvadere? Uh, some objective uh, uh, that you had to take, uh, and the 442nd was given. How did that come about that your that, regiment? That got mountain there? was at the opening of the Po Valley. So, for the movement of troops and supplies, that became an important valley. So, the 442 got the assignment to occupy that area. And that morning was April 21st, 45, which was about four days before ceasefire. Something happened. I lost my field jacket, for example. Something I've never done before. I misplaced it. And so the, the chief sergeant of the company lent me his, which was a special one, a German one with camouflage on one side and white on the other. So I, I think I stood out, which was a big mistake. And we 
took one, knocked out a position, knocked out another one. In the process, I got wounded, got shot through the stomach. But it was a funny thing. There's no pain. When well, you were shot through the stomach, no pain? Yeah, I got a hole here coming out of the back. And my messenger was right behind me with the radio. He says, uh, blood is coming out. So I checked, there was a little hole there. But I, yeah, I didn't feel bad, so we just continued. Now, you'd already taken out one machine gun at this point? Uh, we've taken out one, yeah. One. Then you got hit in the stomach. Yeah. Then uh, we, a couple of more hours, came across three machine guns. How much more time? About two hours later. You went for two hours with a bullet yeah. through your, in your stomach? But it came out. It came out, yeah, yeah. but still. <laughs> you were bleeding. So there were three more left, and I figured I'll do, do what I can. What was your weapon that you were using? A noisy one, Thompson submachine gun. <laughs> it's not accurate, but it makes a lot of noise and scares the hell out of people, you know. <laughs> I had a whole bag of grenades, and I was just lucky. And you kept uh, moving forward with your Tommy gun, and uh, you were leading, going I, after the I was, I knocked out. Guns. I knocked out two more nests. And then the third one shot a rifle grenade, hit my elbow, that was it. Then I got hit in the leg and I couldn't move. All, all of them happened, but after you got hit, uh, you still were able to throw one more grenade that you were getting ready to throw? How did that happen? I, the grenade was in my right hand. Uh -huh. So I was looking around for it, you know, what if it exploded? was still in my fist. I took it out. Somebody was looking after me because it was accurate. Right in his pocket. <laughs> Boom. But there's a footnote to all of this that I've never discussed up until now. The men I went into combat with that day were not Germans. They were the Bersaliari, Italians. As you may recall, early on, the Italian Navy, Air Force, and the Army surrendered. Right. One unit did not surrender. And their, their attitude was, we will surrender if the king tells us to surrender. And the king ain't there because Mussolini is in charge. And they fought, fought like hell. They were great soldiers. None of them surrendered. They were either wounded or killed. I'm sorry to say, but... So after your arm was shot and you threw that other grenade and, and you were hit and you were, you know, rolling down the hill, you said, uh, and you came to down there or you were still or conscious? I crawled up and leaned against a tree and directed the troops. Wow. And your arm was just still Dang, hanging on? Dangling, yeah. Wow. I told the medic to cut it off. He said, oh, no, no. <laughs> well, what happened then? I mean, just your training took over, your instincts, and just... Uh... It's training and instinct, because when I think back, I can't believe I did those things. Uh, I must have been half crazy. <laughs> I'm you know, sure that's not. What would a sane guy do, you know? Well, it's in the heat of combat. Sometimes you do things, I guess. But uh, the thing that has always haunted me, it took nine hours to evacuate me. See, I, we began the battle in the morning. The battle ended about one o'clock, and I stayed there to place the men in their places to dig their sh foxholes, because they always have a counterattack. And then when I felt the time was ready, we went down. Nine hours. 
from three to midnight. Wow. And when I got there, there was a tent about three times the size of this room with all the stretchers lined up. The field hospital. Yeah. And the doctors, the team of doctors would go up and down the line and they're mumbling something. That means send them to the operating room. This one is going to die. This one can wait. So I'm, I'm watching this operation and I can tell what they are saying. When they came to me, the verdict was, God bless you. you know? A couple of minutes later, the chaplain came up. And the chaplain came up, and you know, I'm on the floor. So he gets on his knee, he looks at me, he says, son, God loves you. I say, yeah, I love God too, but I'm not ready to see him. He looked at me, he said, are you serious? I said, absolutely. I'm not ready to go. And so they... And he called back the doctors. The doctors came back, checked me out, set them in. So I went in. My first surgical procedure was done without anesthesia. They were afraid if they gave me anesthetic, I would pass on. Not come back up. And uh, as far as the doctors are concerned, you won't feel anything. <laughs> I can tell you I felt something. <laughs> well, the, uh, and that's where you had the transfusions. And at that field hospital, or was it? Uh, at the field hospital. 17 transfusions. 17 transfusions from the African-American soldiers. Saved your life. That's right. African-American blood saved my life. It's a great, great, great story. Now, you, uh, there's one thing you left out that uh, I think uh, you said once before that before the 21st that uh, when you were first attacked this uh, German line that you all had to, you, uh, your regiment was given the responsibility of scaling a cliff at nighttime to, oh, oh, oh. Uh, that was before, before the, the. This was about a week before week my before. last battle. Tell, tell me about that. How did, well, the regimental commander knew his business. He said, the Germans won't expect us to climb this steep cliff. Then we were all told very seriously, if you should miss your foothold and fall, don't scream. Two of the fellows fell. Doom, doom, doom. That's all you hear. No screams. But when we got up there, we were there when the Germans were lining up for breakfast. And what time of night did you start? About 10. 10, 10 so you were climbing that cliff in for the about six hours. For six hours. And then they were there, and I'm Sad to tell you, but we just about wiped out that company. And that enabled the breakthrough of the line? We did it. The, the commander of 92nd said, we hope you can do this in two weeks. Our company commander says, uh, would it be all right if we did it in six hours? <laughs> well, that's the only way to do it. And you liberated a village there, too. Altanyana. Uh, Altanyana. And, and I broke one of the solemn rules. You should never occupy a church. But this church had the highest steeple, the best observation. So I went up to the priest and I said, may we use this church? And he says, go ahead. So. You could see the whole countryside. Well, how were you treated there? Like, you must have been treated like heroes when you came in, I would suppose, or not. Well, because the platoon I was leading led the charge. And so Italians knew us. 
And there's a footnote, um, it might be misunderstood, but the, here I was in the church, actually in the kitchen. That's where I had my headquarters. The, the battle was over at that point, it was late at night. And uh, the village elders came to see me. They were all dressed up in tuxedos and such. And after the presentation was made, they gave me a scroll and everything else. This fellow who was doing all the translations came up to me and said, do you see those six girls? Which one do you want? What did you say? So I gave my first political speech. I says, I don't know what this meant, but I suppose you were rewarding me with your women. This might have been the practice of the Germans, but not of us. I have a sister where I came from. I have a mother. And I would do everything to protect them. You should be protecting your women. All the girls came up to hug me. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. So the next morning, we're marching out for the next battle. So since my platoon had been the advanced troop, we were in the end. All the people are lined up. The company is going through. When my platoon came through, they threw flowers. <laughs> Just like in the movies. I don't think that ever happened to the German platoons or units. I don't think so. Or the, anyone else. Well, that's quite a story. Um, like you say, it was the beginning of your political <laughs> career. But uh, I think uh, suggests the values of American troops uh, were were different and probably the best in the world of all of the forces on either side. I would think so. I'm, even under those trying conditions, I'm proud to say Americans conducted themselves honorably. Sure, we had mix-ups and what have you. Sure. But we didn't go out of our way to kill children and old ladies, old men. So for you, uh, the war is over at that point, uh, and it's almost over for everybody uh, uh, in, in Europe. Well, the war is <laughs> over. The war is over, and, and you're heading home. I'd just like to ask you some questions to, about, first of all, how, how the war and your action, your combat, uh, the loss of your arm, uh, how that changed your life, how the war changed your life uh, uh, personally. Well, in many ways, uh, my dream of becoming an orthopedic surgeon was out of the window. And uh, can you imagine, I found myself in the same hospital, in the same section, with two others, Bob Dole, who became majority leader, Republican, Philip Hart, the building is named after him, and me three of us in the hospital. So when I was just about getting ready to leave the hospital, I had my last get together with Bob Dole. He was a good friend of mine. And I said, Bob, what are your plans? And without hesitation, Bob Dole said, when I leave this place, I'm gonna be county attorney. You know, confident. First opening in the state legislature, that's where I'll go. First opening in Congress, that's where I'll be. So I get to Congress in 1959. Bob is not here. I send him a telegram. Bob, I'm here. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Did his statement about uh, his career choice uh, influence your thinking? Oh, all? absolutely. Yeah. He said maybe I could so, do that too. I said, you know, that's something to consider, public service. You know, we're, we're sufficiently confident to know that if you want to succeed in the corporate world, we can do it. But here was an opportunity to 
continual service. Why not? Well, while you were recovering, um, did you, uh, you know, today uh, our wounded warriors come back and uh, so much uh, discussion about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Nobody even thought about that in those days, but uh, how did it affect you psychologically during your recovery? Well, there was certain differences between that war and the war today. For example, in combat, I had to censor every letter. My letters got censored by someone above me. And so the folks back home did not have to go through the mental turmoil that you have today, because today you can pick up the telephone and call your husband there. You know? Every day I've seen this happen. We, I had a young lady on my staff at one time. Her husband was in Iraq. They chat every day. Once he did not respond for two days. And she saw on CNN that his unit was in action. She was a goner. She couldn't work. The other thing is, after being deployed there, these men come home. Then they spend six months or a year at home before the next deployment. And imagine coming home and then restoring your relationship with your wife and your children. Everything's happy. The kids are jumping all over you. And when the time comes for you to go, have your son look at you, a young kid, saying, Daddy, don't go. That's what the guy's going through today. It's a terrible turmoil. Yeah. And did you not have any depression uh, in your recovery at all? And, uh... In fact, I enjoyed myself. You did. <laughs> you have well, I, I made it a point. I, I told my doctors, I said, I want to be as far away from Hawaii as I can because I want to see the nation. So my first hotel, and I mean my first uh, hospital assignment was Atlantic City. We had taken over three hotels oh. right on the boardwalk. <laughs> I get kissed by Miss America. <laughs> you get a crap game going again? <laughs> Not there. Not there. But uh, I went to the first re rejuvenated Miss America show. And Miss America show was cut out during the war. And uh, this gal won from New York. And all of us who were on the front row, I wasn't supposed to be on the front row, but I told the surgeon, you know, he's an old buddy. I said, how about putting a cast on my leg? So you put a cast on your leg, you get on the wheelchair, right? So you sit up in the front. And after her crowning, she came down from the stage and shaking hands with all the patients. They're all in wheelchairs. And she would say, where are you from? And all that usual chit chat. She comes up to me and says, Oh, you poor Chinese boy. What? I get the only kiss. <laughs> it worked. It did. It worked. Uh, what would you say uh, the major lessons from your experience in World War II that, that guided you through the rest of your life and career? Well, for one thing, I've learned that this is a great country. In the beginning, they, for example, labeled me an enemy in. But this country acknowledged and recognized the mistake they made, sending Japanese Americans into these camps and apologized. What other nation has ever done that in history? Just think about that. No one is a problem. 
But America has apologized. And for that, I'm ever grateful. And did it, uh, how would you think uh, the major ways in which the war changed America uh, in your lifetime since then? Uh, well, in the most important ways. Before December the 7th, America was a good nation, trying its best to keep, with, keep up with the rest of the world. After World War II, we became a super nation for one reason, the people were together. You know, when you consider that just about every family was somehow involved, either a son or a father or an uncle or cousin or auntie. And when you look back, little kids were collecting pennies, copper wirings, juvenile kids were doing Victory Gardens. We were all involved, not just the guy who was carrying the gun. And that makes a big difference. Today, 1% of the population is involved. They're in a camp. So every chance I have, I go to these camps to thank them for their service. Anyone who's willing to stand in harm's way for me, I'd do anything for him. How, how about the social changes that occurred after the war that were, what were the most important uh, developments? Well, from your we, I, I didn't expect this, but uh, we got home, we were all heroes. You know, they had parades and all these things. And, um, here I was young, but we had the GI Bill. And as a result, I got a law degree. And here I am. So the GI Bill itself was uh, created an educational renaissance. It's the first time any country had ever done that. And that was the best investment they ever made. 20% of America participated. And when you look at how we operate this government, December 7th, I was an enemy alien. Today, I'm president pro tem of the Senate. We're sitting in the office. The line of succession, vice president, speaker, president pro tem. I'm third in line to succeed the president. They made me chairman of the Appropriations Committee. You know, what other nation would ever do that? Quite an amazing story from a 17-year-old Japanese-American that attack of Pearl Harbor to where you are today. What other country would have? Sure. No place else. No place else. And there were advances uh, in civil rights and women's rights yep. as a result of the war, wouldn't you say? I'm convinced that it takes a little while, it takes some blood, some sacrifice, but this country moves forward. What would you say to America's youth today, based on your experience? You are very fortunate. You live in a great country. We make mistakes, but this country acknowledges mistakes. It's not easy, but we do it. We also have opportunities. Now, you would look at me and you say, no, you'll never be majority leader or chairman of the Appropriations Committee. But here I am. Are you they optimistic about the future? Very. Sure, the, these times I've gone through, well, since 1959, I've seen the ups and downs of this Congress. But we always move forward. And we don't repeat this every day. But there are 33 words that are very sacred to all of us. We do the 
repetition a little differently, but we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's operational, believe me. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? Country. And if it weren't for that, I won't be sitting here. That's right. Well, Senator, it's been the most engaging hour, as it always is with you. But uh, to hear a story from you, and uh, a story that will live on for many generations, it's uh, an honor uh, for me. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. You're a great American. <laughs>